God draws near when we worship him. Amen? <laughs> oh, up here? <laughs> wow, that's the first time anybody ever told me I wasn't talking loud enough. <laughs> Praise God. Um, but God is so good. We, have, we love coming on Monday nights. I love to pray, love to worship God. Uh, I love the, the spirit on Monday nights. And, of course, my brother Bob, um, my roomie. <laughs> we were roommates at Zion way back, if you didn't know. Uh, <clears throat> and so we've known each other for a number of years. And uh, we are just blessed, really blessed. Uh, every time that we have come and... and um, my wife, in particular, she just, she loves this fellowship. And uh, she loves every time that we get to come. And so she's, <laughs> I think her and Bob have this thing. Uh, they, you know, they're trying to, to get me to, to, to get closer, to move closer. And, and <laughs> you know, <clears throat> God will do what God wants to do. <laughs> he has his, his plan and, and his in, intent in mind. But it's so good to be able to, to be here again tonight. And I really want to, I, I, I have a sense in my spirit that God wants to speak to us. And that he really wants to reveal himself to us. Uh, and that we need to be attentive. I, I don't think it's any coincidence that we've been coming on Monday night prayers and and. And uh, God has been moving and directing us to get back to the place of prayer, back to that place where we cry out to him, where we, when we know that we need him. We can do nothing, we can be nothing apart from him. And he seems to be drawing us back to that place of intimacy, that place of communion, that place where we are one together with him. Because I really believe that as a body, and I'm talking about the, the body of Christ, many of us have gone our own way, done our own thing, and we've gone off track. God is wanting to call us back. Back into communion and, and intimacy and fellowship with Him. Nothing happens apart from our intimacy with God, our ministry, our lives, whatever God desires for us, to do in us, through us, everything comes out of our intimacy with Him. If you don't have intimacy and communion with God, you'll never know the plan and purpose of God for your life because it's in that time of intimacy and communion that He speaks, that He draws, that He impresses into your spirit speaks into us. And so, <clears throat> recognizing that, realizing that, we must realize the day in which we find ourselves. And we must be completely honest in our evaluation before God. And recognize that God is drawing and leading and that God is desiring He's desiring to fill his plan, fulfill his plan and purpose on the earth. He's desiring to bring us into the culmination of all things. He's preparing us for the time of the end. Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Soon and then we realize. I believe that if we really knew God's timeline and how soon his coming was, we would probably live our lives a lot differently. We would prioritize our lives, and we would make sure that things were in order and that we would be ready. Amen? Ready, because if we knew, if we knew that Jesus was coming in a week, wouldn't you live your life differently? Wouldn't you spend your next seven days a lot differently maybe than you had planned. You'd change your plans, wouldn't you? I would hope that you would if you absolutely knew 
Jesus is coming. And yet, He is coming. But we don't live in the expectancy that He's coming. We don't live as if He is coming. Many times we live like this earth is all there is. We get so attached to the here, to the now, to the mundane, to the things of life. So used to things. God has to shake us sometimes. <laughs> Cause us to quake a little bit, to draw us back into His plan and purpose because many times His plan and purpose is much different than our plans, our purpose. And He has to work things out in our life to bring us in line because that should be our prayer. <laughs> that should be our prayer. Lord, I want what You would have in my life. I want Your desires to be my desires. So thinking Thinking in that vein, I had, I had planned, purposed to go into another passage of Scripture. But as I walked in tonight, God does this sometimes. <laughs> he kind of changes your mind and he reminds us of some things. And it, it, it runs along the same vein. Uh, but he wants me, I believe, to go into another passage of Scripture. And I want to take a look at... I think two passages of Scripture tonight. One, to prepare our hearts to be able to hear and to see. We must be able to hear and we must be able to see so that we can receive. God wants to speak. He's here. His presence and anointing is here and He has not just a word that he wants to speak to us. He wants to reveal to us. Not only to us, but he wants to be revealed in us. In us. He wants to reveal his plan and purpose to us, in us, and through us. Amen? Amen. So if you'll go with me to a little tiny book, two little tiny books actually. They're called Minor Prophets, but that's not because their, their, their word is minor in any way. They are, their word is power-packed. These are dynamic words from God, and they are filled with power, but they're in little, little books. Uh, you know, you have the major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and even Daniel. But then you have the smaller books. But it's not small in power and small in anointing. In fact, these words are spoken directly, I believe, to this generation, to our time. And it would take, uh, it would be very, very beneficial for us to take a good look at what he has to say through these prophets. So one of them is in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And uh, I love this guy, <laughs> this guy Habakkuk. <clears throat> um, first of all, his name is, is amazing because his name literally means to cling to, to hold fast to. And, it, and it, the implication here is that he's holding to God. He's holding fast. To God. He's clinging to God with everything that He is. And I love that. I love that name. I wish that God would, would nickname me Habakkuk. That I would be Habakkuk to Him. That I would cling to Him. Desire Him more than I desire anything else. That I, I would adhere to Him. That, that we would be inseparable. Amen? Amen. Jesus, remember what Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Jesus wants to be yoked together with him. Any farmers here in the house? Anybody 
work the farm or the plows or the... No, maybe not. <laughs> but in speaking that word, he was speaking to a bunch of people who worked the land, who were used to farming. And when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, what he's speaking of is, is being yoked together. They would yoke the, the mature ox to the immature, younger ox. And the two would be yoked together. A yoke would be placed about their neck. They would be attached. There would be no way for this young buck to, to get away from the, the more mature ox. They were yoked together. They were stuck together. They were tied together. And Jesus said, be yoked together with me. Take my yoke upon you. He said, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But be yoked together with me. That's what Habakkuk's name means, to be yoked together with God, to be, to be so attached to him that even if I wanted to, I can't go anywhere because I'm attached, right? <clears throat> even if I, if I had a, an inkling to look over there, I can't go over there because I'm attached. <laughs> I'm tied to him. I, 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 we are glued together. There's nothing that separates me from him. That's what that name means, and I love that. I love that name. <clears throat> and that's the desire, really, that you see in this prophet. And the prophet is preparing himself. He knows that God is about to reveal himself in a powerful way. He knows that God is about to speak to him. And so he prepares himself in this small little book. We see him readying himself to receive from God. God is about to come. God is about to reveal himself. God's going to show something, and he wants to be ready. He knows that he must prepare himself in order to receive what God has for him. And I kind of feel like tonight, the Spirit of God is speaking to us to get ready. Prepare yourself, because I'm about to reveal myself. I'm about to show up. I'm about to speak. I'm about to reveal. But you must be ready. Ready to receive what I have for you. So we see him, first of all, posturing himself. He said, I'm going to set myself upon my rampart. I'm going to separate myself from, from the here and the now, the mundane and everything, and I'm going to, I'm going to set myself. I love that. I'm going to set myself. This past week, the Spirit of God spoke to me and uh, through another brother who sent me a, a message from David Wilkerson. Uh, David Wilkerson was always near and dear to my heart. In fact, uh, we were ordained. I was ordained in the ministry through the, through the ministry and work of David Wilkerson through Times Square Church. And so David Wilkerson is, is special to me anyway. And so when my brother sent me this word, I was thrilled, you know. <clears throat> and I kind of remembered this part of this message that, that he sent to me. And the gist of, of what he was, was saying in, in this word was that the prophet, the prophet prepared himself. He said he, he established his heart and he prepared his heart so that he could hear from God. He made himself ready. He took away every distraction. He set himself apart. And he prepared himself. And so, and this is what I think the Spirit of God is speaking to us, to get ready. But you've got to posture yourself. There's a posturing that happens when you talk, talk about faith. Because faith, is believing in spite of. Faith is substance. It's tangible. It's real. And it's evidence. It's evidenced. It's substance. 
of what is believed for, hoped for, being assured of, and evidence of what is not seen, not yet seen, not yet received. But you know that you know that you know. Even though I can't see it, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I just know I have an expectancy in my spirit. That's faith. There's an expectancy, and there must be when you talk about faith. There has to be an expectancy. There has to be uh, one of those, I know that I know, even though I can't see. <laughs> even though everything may be contrary, I still know that I know that I know. I know that God is going to fulfill his word. I know that his promise to me is true. Even though everything is, is working against me, even though the demons of hell are throwing whatever they can against me, and we're there, believe me, I'm with you. My brother Bob, he, we, we talked this past week. Whatever that hell can throw against you is being thrown against you. But it doesn't matter because we know that we know that we know that we know. Hello. God said it and it will be. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I do know he's never late. And it will be even as he said. So there's an expectancy. And the prophet was expecting. He was believing God. He prepared himself. He took away every distraction. All right? I know God's going to speak to me. I know he's going to show up. There's an expectancy in my spirit. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know how he's coming. But I know he's coming. He's coming. I can sense it. I can feel it. He's about to move. He's about to reveal. And so I got to prepare myself. I got to take away all the distractions. And I got to remove myself from every hindering factor. That's exactly what he did. When he set himself upon the rampart, he removed himself from whatever distracted him, held him back, kept him, and he put himself in the place where he could hear without distraction. Where he could see without being bothered. He was a watchman on the wall. And he set himself upon his station. I'm going to go and I'm going to look over the city. I'm going to watch. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to watch. That should be our posture as we come to God. I'm going to watch and I'm going to wait. I'm going to see, not with just natural eyes. I must see through the eyes of the Spirit. I must hear, not with just natural ears. I've got to hear through the, through the hearing in my spirit. God is about to come. He's about to reveal himself. And i got to know that I know. I know he's coming. I don't know when, so I've got to wait. But I'm not just waiting on God. I'm waiting in God. I'm waiting in him. I'm believing in his word. Trusting in his word. In faith, I'm standing, and I'm waiting, not impatiently, oh, what am I going to do? What I, no, 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 no. I'm waiting in him, and I'm expecting. And God sees that, and God knows that. And so that's what the, the prophet did, and I love, I love that here in the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk. <clears throat> he says, I'll take my stand at my watch post and I'll station myself upon my tower and I'll look out to see what he will say to me. He's postured himself. 
He's waited. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> I just saw that over there. That's really cool. Okay, yes, I'll stand upon my watch. Set me upon my... Did you just change it on me? <laughs> okay, your, your different versions. I like that. That's cool. That's amazing. I just saw that up there, and I'm just like, wow, that's the, that's the passage of Scripture right there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There it is. Hallelujah. Amen. And so he says, I'm not just going to, to hear. I'm going to see. I will watch. I'll watch and see what God says. He didn't just say, I'm going to hear, I'm going to wait to hear what God has to say to me. No. He said, he said specifically, I'm going to watch and I'm going to see. I'm going to look expectantly into the perfect law of liberty. Isn't that what James said to do? Look expectantly into, into the perfect law of liberty. He said, I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch for him. And I'm going to see. I'm going to perceive. I'm going to know. This is what he's saying. Exactly what he says when he speaks to me. But this is what he was saying. He said, I'm not just going to hear his words. He was of the mindset and of the heart. I'm going to not only hear what he has to say. I want to, I want to feel what he feels. I want, to, I want his heart to be revealed because when he speaks to me, his heart is going to be revealed to me. He was in that place of communion and intimacy and he knew God and he said, when he reveals himself, when he comes and he speaks, he's going to speak and I'm going to know in the depths of my spirit what he's feeling, what he desires, what is his heart. I don't want to just hear what you have to say, God. I want your heart to be revealed to me so that I know how you feel. I know what pleases you. Do you see the heart of the prophet here? Very specific in his wording. So that we would understand and know he's not just waiting to hear a word from God. I want to see, Lord God. I want it to be revealed to me. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth. Reveal yourself to me so that I know, that I know, that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Your heart revealed to me. This is what I believe the Spirit of God would have us in our posturing even tonight and for Sunday morning. In our posturing, in our preparing ourselves, let this be your heart, my heart, our mindset as we prepare ourselves to receive from God. Now, I'm not going to go into that complete passage of Scripture. I just wanted to share that portion with you. And I want to go to another small book, the book of Haggai, chapter 2. I'm picking on the minor prophets tonight. <clears throat> the small book of Haggai, right between Zephaniah and Zechariah, is the small, tiny book of Haggai. <clears throat> Only two chapters in this <laughs> little book. And we're going into the second, again, we're going into the second chapter. And I believe that, that God 
is speaking directly into our time, into our day, because God is beginning to quicken, to call, and to stir in us. And this is the reason. I believe this is the reason that he's doing just that. So if you begin to read in, there you go. <laughs> in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And he said, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Now what he's talking about is Solomon's temple. The first temple. God is saying, who is left among you who remember the glory of the first house? That first temple, Solomon's temple. That temple had been destroyed, remember, by the Babylonians. They've now returned to the land. They've come out of captivity. They've gone back and they have rebuilt the house of the Lord. And so now they're getting ready to dedicate the second house. And God is speaking to the prophet and saying to the prophet, do you remember the glory of the former house? Do you remember? Who's left among you who remembers what it was like? And he's talking about Solomon's temple. I believe he's speaking the same word to us today. Is there anybody left among you who knew the former glory? The former house. How many of you know there's a new house? There's a second temple. Been replaced. The first one was destroyed. And now a new temple has taken its place. A new one. But how many are here who remember the former house? And this is what God is speaking to the, to the prophet. How many are among you, who's left among you, who remembers the former house? So he speaks this word. To them, who is left among you? And he says to them, and how do you see it now? This new temple, in your eyes, God is saying, now tell me the truth. Be honest with me. Look at this house. Look at this new temple. In your eyes, compared to what you knew, of the first house. Compare. Compare. In your own eyes, in your own estimation, how do you see it? God says to the prophet, isn't it in your eyes as nothing? In other words, isn't this nothing in comparison to the former house? Do you remember the glory of the first house? Do you know what made that first temple so glorious, so great, so grand, so wonderful? It wasn't the architecture, although it was they say a, a, an ancient wonder uh, of the ancient world. People came from far and wide to, to see this house, the glory of the house. I had opportunity. I went to Sao Paulo two years ago. And they have uh, one of the churches there, very, very big church, um, made a, a, an almost exact replica of, the, of Solomon's temple. And, and the, the edifice, I really wanted to see it. <laughs> I had in my mind's eye, man, if there was one thing that I could do while I'm here, Lord, <laughs> it would be I would really love just to see it. I, I just want to see it. And, uh, and so when I got to the, to the airport, my brother says, Pastor Mike, we have some time before our brother is coming to pick us up. If there's one thing that you would want to do, what would be... What would be that thing? Is there somewhere I can take you? And I thought to myself, here's your opportunity. And I said, brother, there is one thing that I really desire. I would love to see Solomon's temple. 
I'd love to go to that place. And he, let's go. And it wasn't far from where we were. And so he knew exactly we got there, you know. And it was kind of like between times. They have tours and, and all of this, you know. And, but it was between times, and nobody was there. There was just one guy at the gate, and uh, he said, wait, wait just a minute. Spare a minute. Wait, wait just a minute, he said. He said, <laughs> he said I'm, I'm going to call uh, a, an, another brother who, who is here. And so we were waiting, and he said he's going to call somebody. And so this man comes around the corner. He's got a big smile on his face. And, he's, and he says to me, and he's, he's about 10 feet away, and he says, you, you are, are an American. And I said, yes, I am, and you're speaking English. He said, I'm from New York. <laughs> I said, praise God. He said, I just got here this afternoon. And he said, as soon as my brother heard, he says, I know exactly who to, who to bring who can talk to you. Oh, I said, oh, brother. I said, you know, I, and I told him, I'm a missionary. I came here, you know, to, to have some services and whatever. And my brother, we have some time. And I said, it's really in my heart. I, I wanted to see this place. Really wanted to see. Well, I got a personal guided one-on-one -on -one tour of the complete place. It, uh, it was like stepping back into the pages of the scripture. I mean, I was amazed. I mean, the scale is correct. It's, it's amazing. Every bit of the architecture came from the Holy Land. The granite, everything that went into the construction. They're, they have 500-year-old olive trees that were taken from the land of Israel. I, it's, I was amazed because they have the Garden of Gethsemane there. Off to, you know, off to the side. It's amazing. Really amazing. They also have a, an exact re replica of the tabernacle in the wilderness with all of the, the instruments, the, you know, the altar of incense, all of the rest. But as I stood there, in front, I was just amazed. I was blown away by the edifice itself, by the architecture, by the marble. I mean, I was blown away. It was just a beauty to behold. Even the instruments, the Ark of the Covenant, all of them overlaid in, in pure gold, I want, I want you to know. The, the doors are gold. It's just fantastic. I can't imagine, and I'm thinking to myself, as wonderful as I see this, this place that doesn't have the glory of the former house, how glorious, how beautiful, how wonderful, how majestic. In my mind's eye, I'm thinking, what must that first temple have been like? It must have been something to behold. It must have been a, a glory beyond words. But what made that place so special was that God himself, came down in that place. He revealed himself to them. Do you remember when they, they had that uh, grand opening there? When they had the dedication of Solomon's temple? They said the presence of God was so strong. The priests couldn't stand to minister. The glory of God filled that house. God's touch... God's anointing, God's presence came down in that place. And that place was unlike any other place on the face of the earth. God said, look at the house that stands before you. Look at the temple that stands before. It was like me looking at this replica of the temple. I mean, the architecture the same, materials the same, the gold, the, the fabric. I mean, it was glorious, but the presence of God wasn't there. God's anointing wasn't there. God, it looked good on the outside. I mean, 
looked amazing, but, but what was missing from that house was God. This is what God speaks to the prophet. So there's coming a day when you're going to look back and you're going to recognize a new temple has taken the place of the former. And it isn't going to, it may look the same. Have a form of God, godliness, but the presence and anointing of God. The glory of the first house would be absent from that place. When they dedicated the second temple, it was said in the, in the scripture that you couldn't tell the difference between the old men who were wailing and crying who remembered the glory of the former house and the young men who were singing and rejoicing and completely oblivious, didn't know. You couldn't tell the difference between the, the, the shouts of praise and the, the weeping and the crying and the wailing. And that's what God speaks to this prophet. And I believe that's the day we find ourselves in. And I had a talk with Pastor Bob just a little while ago, and I said, man, it's getting stranger and stranger. We see strange things happening, and the church is not looking anything like what we remember as the church. Names are changing. Uh, they're doing away with, with prophecy, prophecy, prophetic words, changing the names, changing visions, changing all to please men and, and, to, and to cater to a new generation who doesn't know him. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is the day we find ourselves in. This is exactly speaking to us in our day. And yet God speaks a word to this prophet. And he says to him in verse 4, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, high priest. Be strong, all people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I'm with you. I'm with you, declares the Lord of hosts. And he says in verse 5 something that's key. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Something's coming. Something's happening. And it's going to be according to the covenant that I made with you. My covenant with you has not changed. And if you look in the scripture, it's the very same covenant that he makes with us and Christ. Because Christ is the Passover lamb. It's the same word. It's the same God. It's the same covenant. It's the same desire from God. So God says it'll be according to the covenant. You've got to go back to the covenant that I made, and remember the covenant. Because today we have forgotten the covenant. Today, we come to Christ by repeating a prayer at an altar, but that's not scriptural. Nobody gets saved by repeating after me. According to the word of God, Jesus didn't lead anybody in a sinner's prayer. What did he say? You're clean through what? Through the word that I'm speaking to you. The word that I speak to you, they are spirit and their life. Take heed to my word. My word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path not by works of righteousness which you've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by what? 
the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. We are washed and renewed by the Holy Spirit with pure water. That's the water of the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Faith comes, but you got to hear God. The Spirit of God speaks, and you got to have ears to be able to hear. This is what produces faith. When He speaks, something happens into me, in my spirit. Because He's God. When He speaks, things are created. So if He speaks into my spirit, guess what? That which was dead suddenly comes alive. Because God is speaking. God breathed. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. It's God breathed. God spoke into my spirit one day. And I came alive by the word of God. When I heard the voice of God, speaking into my spirit through his word, I realized and understood the word is real. And I said, yes, Lord. And when in my spirit I said, yes, Lord, I agree. I come into agreement with that word. I believe. In that moment, life, by the word of God, I came alive. An exchange took place at the cross. It's got to be always about the cross. We've made it about so many other things. Nobody wants to talk about the cross anymore. It's antiquated. It's old-fashioned. The blood of Jesus. Who wants to talk about that? But there's no salvation apart from the cross. It's got to be according to the covenant. The covenant is the cross. When he brought them out of Egypt, the Passover lamb, hello, was Christ. Christ is the Passover lamb. The blood was shed put upon the doorposts, the lintels of the homes. And salvation came through the blood of the sacrifice of the spotless lamb. Hallelujah. 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 Salvation came when they heard the word and they acted on it. They heard what God said and they did what God said. They believed the word and did what God said to do. And guess what? They were redeemed. They were saved. <laughs> they were freed from their bondage, from their slavery, from their iniquity. They were released from their prison. Through obedience to the word in the sacrifice that was made for them. It's always been about the covenant. God says, I'm a covenant keeping God. This is my covenant that I make with you. You are to be my people. Mine. You don't belong to yourselves anymore. I'm purchasing you. He ransomed them. He redeemed them. He bought them. They were slaves in Egypt. And God purchased them. He bought them. And brought them to himself. We are purchased by God. An exchange is made at the cross. 
give me your life. I'll give you mine. Give up. When they came out of Egypt, God said to them, listen, you've got to give up everything you know. You've got to come out from everything you're used to. Apart from everything that you knew as your life. Everything's different from now on. You've got to follow me and my word. And I will lead you. I will guide you. I will direct you. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. But you've got to be attentive. You've got to do everything because everything that I speak to you will be for your good. And if you follow my word and do everything that I say, I'll lead you, guide you, protect you, sustain you, keep you. What did they have need of? Nothing. Nothing. Thing. He provided it all. Provided it all. And he says the same thing to us. But it's not preached that way this now. But an exchange is made at the cross. Come and die. The cross is an altar. It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of death. Somebody died so you could live. An exchange is about to take place. you got to lay down your sin, your life, your desires. You are slaves in bondage to sin. And somebody has just paid the price to redeem you from your slavery. So now, you no longer belong to that hard taskmaster. Now... You come into the family of God, for he purchased you with his own blood. Amen. He purchased you. And he says to you, when you come to the cross, there's an exchange. Give me your life. I'll give you mine. Let me live now through you. If you do everything I say, are attentive to my word, walk according to my ways, I will be to you a father. Everything you need will be supplied. There's nothing that you will need apart from him. But we don't get that gospel today. We say a prayer at an altar, we get up, we go home and we live our life and nothing has changed. That is not salvation. I look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and, and I'm astounded Because I think to myself, how many really who call themselves by his name are really and truly his? How many are living still for themselves? Just take on a Christian name. Call themselves by a name. Join a club. But continue to live their life like they want to live their life. Continue to do the things that they've always done, continuing their same mindset, continuing their same lives, and call themselves sick. They want the best blessings and benefits. Oh, heal my body when I'm sick. Give me a job when I need it. Give me what I need. You've got to cease from existence. When something's dead, it's dead. A dead man hasn't got an opinion. Isn't that right? I never asked a dead corpse if you have it. Do you like being dead? What do you think about your state of being? <laughs> They're dead. We are dead.
Isn't that what Paul said? You are dead, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You're dead. You and I died at the cross. We ceased to exist. The old me is no longer me. Thank God. Thank God. So now I must renew my mind, erase the tapes, and start talking like God would have me to talk, thinking the way he would have me to think, renew my mind according to the word of God, get his word down into my spirit so that I can change and walk in the way that my father would have me to walk. It's got to be according to the covenant. God said, if you're going to see what I have for you, it has to be according to the covenant. We'll go into more about that on Sunday. We'll talk more about the covenant on Sunday. But I want to whet your appetite, your spiritual hunger, and your juices. I want them to begin to flow so that you're hungering and thirsting, so by the time Sunday comes, you're salivating, waiting to hear. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> I want to get my teeth into that word. <laughs> because God said he's about to fulfill his word. And this is the reason he's calling us to come to pray. No other reason. No other reason. He's not calling us to pray so that, to, to bless us physically, spirit, you know, whatever. No, no, no. Although it's a blessing, yes. Always a blessing when you come into the presence of God. But God's purpose and intent in calling us at this time is so he can fulfill his word. I'm about to fulfill my word. And I want you to be ready ready to receive because he's about to do something and he says here according to the covenant for thus says the lord hallelujah the lord of hosts yet once more once more it's in a little while he said, I'm going to begin to shake heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. How many of you know there's a shaking going on? Hello? If you don't know, you better know. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. God is shaking in this last day. Hallelujah. I'll shake all nations. So that what? The treasure of all nations shall come in. He's not talking about your silver and your gold. He says that later. He said the silver is mine, yeah. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Not your silver, not your gold. He's not talking about money. He, he's calling forth the treasure of the nations. And we'll talk more about that on Sunday. The treasure of of the nations, because whether you know it or not, we are that treasure. We have this treasure, the scripture says, in earthen vessels. Ah, that the excellency and the power may be of God and not of us. This treasure, his treasure, it's his treasure that he wants to bring forth. He's gathering from the nations his treasure. And we are that treasure. That's all I'm going. I'm, I'm not going back into that. We'll go more into that on Sunday. <clears throat> I'm going to whet your appetite just a little bit because he says this. Once more, I'm going to shake. And what's going to happen? What is going to be revealed? 
God's about to show up. He's about to reveal himself. I will fill this house. You know that temple you saw that you in your eyes was nothing? That one. <laughs> that house that you think there's no way. It's nothing like the former. He said, I'm about to do something. In this last day, in this, one more time, one more time. <laughs> oh my God, if you, could, if you could feel what I'm feeling right now and know what I'm feeling right now. My God, I'm going to fill this house, this house with my glory. Ah, not, not like the first house, not like the former temple. No, because that was a, a man-made structure. That I came down and my presence filled that place. But the temple, the temple that I'm going to fill, huh, is not just one house. Because Paul says, I'm speaking to you a mystery. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. So what temple is he going to fill with his glory? And that's why in this day it's going to be a greater anointing, a greater power, a greater manifestation because God's presence came down in one geographical location, in one particular place, and he poured himself out there among them. But when God says, what I'm about to do, what I'm about to do when my people posture themselves, when they come to realize what I'm about to do, and I'm going to fulfill my word, I'm going to fill these temples with my glory, my treasure I will bring from all over the earth. You'll shine as gold and silver. My glory is about to be revealed. I am about to pour out myself. I'm about to reveal myself. So prophet, position yourself. Get yourself on your rampart. Watch. Get in your high tower. Put on your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears and get ready. God is about to reveal himself. He's about to show himself. And he will reap from the nations the harvest from those treasures who will be released and revealed in this last day, who are walking in the power of the covenant. The power of of the covenant, his power, his anointing. No flesh is going to glory in the presence of God. It's not about me, my ministry, my church, my nothing. It's all him. And he is about to reveal himself. I want you to begin to pray. And seek the Lord and ready yourself. There's more. <laughs> There's more. We've got to be ready.
We've got to be ready to, to give ourselves. Present ourselves. Prepare our heart. So I'm getting you ready tonight. I should say the Spirit of God is speaking, calling. Getting you hungry for what he's about to do. So that when you go home, you're going to go on your face and you're going to cry out to God and you're going to begin to seek him. This is the reason he's calling us. He's speaking. The shaking we'll know is the voice of God speaking. Because when God speaks, things happen. God is speaking. God is calling. And this is the reason. Let's stand together, shall we? Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Can you give God some praise? Give God some thanks. Hallelujah.